Hello, Professor. I see your name Appenzeller, and I've always wondered, does Appenzeller actually mean anything in German? So it, it, uh, it, the, um, the family trees go back to Switzerland, uh, but okay. my father tracked this. Um, so there's actually a county, Appenzell, in, uh, in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, but we, we tracked back. My, my father did a pretty good job. I think he went back uh, 12 generations and, and still just German. But what it means is it's a cell. Cella means cell. Cell of the, and Appen means abbey. Abbey. So it's a, okay. uh, it's, it's a place where people were praying, uh, monks came together. And, and so around this um, um, abbey where all the monks were living, apparently uh, settlers kind of found their way of living around there, benefited from um, coming together and trading or whatever. Uh, but that must have been uh, quite a few hundred years ago. So, <laughs> but that's what it means, um, cell of the abbey. Yeah. Okay. Well, so... Because I, I was going to no. my very brief German lessons, I remember. I think yeah. Appel, no. or Appel is, is a... No, no so, it's not. So you mentioned that you your family goes back to Switzerland, but where, where do you kind of originally spring up from? So where's your hometown? My hometown in, in Germany is... Um, close to the uh, middle, middle west of Germany. It's in this steel production and coal mining area where I grew up. Uh, okay. And uh, then I went to study in Aachen, um, uh, Germany. That's at the border to the Netherlands and Belgium. And mm -hmm. uh, I studied physics there. So uh, that's that's kind of my upbringings. And, and I was, I was uh, if you don't mind me kind of using oh, of this just to expand a little bit. So I was um, actually born as a, as a first child to my uh, father being a, a banker, a bank employee, and my mother being an accountant. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they grew up in Second World War, so there was uh, uh, no way for them to get a higher education in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm one of the very first in my entire family going, going this route, certainly the only one that decided for this STEM direction. So I'm, I'm saying that because sometimes people are talking about legacy and, and uh, okay, there is some kind of bias. Uh, that was certainly not the case for me because there was nothing like this. I was growing up free roaming, really outside. I loved nature. I asked myself always the questions, why is the sky blue? Why are the leaves green? Trying to understand humankind, like people, like talking to people. I feel communication and understanding other people is uh, probably the most important thing in life besides having some deep knowledge uh, when it comes to, to the science part. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, then at uh, a relatively early stage, I, uh, I started to feel that hands-on experience is, is something that I enjoyed a lot. And so my mm -hmm. father and I built, while I was in middle school, uh, mo model ships with remote control. Uh, okay. And uh, so I, I learned a lot there. And uh, also this hands-on experience to deal with wood, to deal with soldering and, and bending wires and so on. It was just a great experience that, that I had growing up. And I think ultimately these, because you asked this question, I think ultimately these were the roots that made me then feel, yeah, that experimental work is actually something I like a lot. So. Yeah. So what kind of experimental process is it that gets you excited? Is it thinking of how to do the experiment or bending the wires or, you know, seeing the result of all the labor? Because there are yes. all kinds of different ways people like to approach their work. Yeah, that's right. So if, if I would not have gotten any formal scientific education, mm -hmm. I think I would have loved to become a carpenter. So really okay. to see this process of, of getting things done and and the outcome, it's quite different from obviously you could argue what we are doing now, but <laughs> making something and, and, and you kind of giving it shape and, mm -hmm. and kind of controlling the process of creativity, right? I, mm -hmm. I, I like to think about uh, myself as somebody that, that likes to be creative. Maybe sometimes I'm not, maybe sometimes I am, but this process mm -hmm. of building something creatively, I, I think that is something that I felt always incredibly uh, appealed by. So, ah, so yeah. it's, it's a type of creativity that comes from the interplay of the limitations of the whatever it is you're working on with the sort of uh, hands-on creative of overcoming whatever it is that it has done, is that correct? Or? Yeah, and, and actually what you said is very true. You could further expand on it now when I decided to go more into this academic direction. Mm -hmm. uh, me, me trying to push myself to learn more 
uh, was motivated by my desire to be able to apply what I was able then to learn to become more creative. I think that's that's the strongest driving force for me to keep learning and improving because I have that strong uh, eagerness to kind of apply it then to to higher levels, if you want, of mm -hmm. creativity. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's very interesting. Because I know, like, because like, as I like look around in academia, it seems like there are a, a variety of different kind of. Because I, I guess there's a variety of approaches that people take toward their work, right? Some people are, you know, very excited by just the theoretical possibility of something. Some people are excited by the practical applications, and some people are excited by just, you know, the sheer "can we do it" part of the work. So, of this kind of spectrum of between very practical and very theoretical, like where would you say you kind of land on this uh, sort of spectrum? So, I guess the reason that I brought up at the beginning this free roaming part and the curiosity in general that I feel is because um, I, I, I have a wide interest. I, I'm, I'm, I'm broad, I would argue. I, I was mm -hmm. always very much into sports. I was very much interested, as I said, in communication with people, understanding humankind. Um, I, I educated myself about uh, illnesses to some extent. Uh, and, and so this breadth, I think, also applies to my curiosity in, in my current field. You will see that students of mine are not only doing the uh, experimental work, I'm asking mm -hmm. them to do the interpretation. I'm asking them to come up with their own models. I'm asking mm -hmm. them to do their own simulations certainly not claiming to the depth of my very famous uh, colleagues that are working on simulations exclusively. But I mm -hmm. like this idea of, of having a broad knowledge base and applying this. That was always my, my, uh, my belief. And I think that's also mm -hmm. what I'm trying to tell my students when they are working together with me. So. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's like the, it reminds me like it kind of, I, I have a very similar view on science is that you should have a sort of A to Z, at least somewhat understanding of what you're doing. Otherwise, you know, you might develop the best theoretical thing ever, but it's made of spherical cows. <laughs> and then it's, well, you know, it's like, okay, cool. But, uh, but it, so it's good. To, I think yeah, I agree to have a very broad uh, knowledge of, of a lot of things. But this actually brings up a more practical question for somebody who does have a more kind of broad interest. How do you find the balance between being so broad that you cannot contribute meaningfully in any area, right? Because that's, you know, if you're too diffuse, it's difficult. And if you're too specialized, you end up with this sort of like blinders of, I, you know, I have a hammer, I can hit nails with it, and everything is a nail now, you know? How do you, how do you balance this sort of uh, tension between being hyper-specialized and, and too broad to, to be able to make any impact? I, I think at the end of the day, what um, I always like to tell people is that, um, uh, a problem is like a, a picture, uh, and and you know this famous saying that if you only see uh, or touch the elephant's tail, then you can conclude one thing. If you touch the elephant's trunk, you can conclude another thing. So mm -hmm. the breadth in my mind means to have a complete picture. So okay. I'd rather see the complete elephant. But then mm -hmm. if, once I see the complete picture, right, once I have all these pieces of ingredients making sense, I see the complete picture, then you can ask, very specific questions. And you can ask the question of, well, how do I ensure that the elephant is healthy? Or how do I make sure that the elephant is not tripping if it's walking? Or whatever question you want to ask, right? Mm -hmm. But if you don't understand the elephant is an elephant, there is yeah. no solution you can offer. And, and so understanding things in breadth is the prerequisite to solving in-depth questions at the end of the day. I see. So you apply a sort of general picture idea and then we sort of narrow down to the specific and then you specialize then based on your broad understanding down to a very specialized approach to something because at the end of the day an experiment has to measure a specific thing and right. require specific expertise so whenever you approach a new area or a new problem uh, what well, your sort of method i guess for for doing this you so you 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 start with the a, a dark room right and you need to get a picture of the elephant and then you have to make these specific experiments and measurements how, how do you uh, how do you go about doing that yeah so i like i like to um, tell students that we are little detectives right 
It's like uh, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, you, as you said, you are in the dark room and, and there is a murderer. Uh, the, I mean, uh, something has happened, right? And, and so now you need to kind of deduce. And, uh, and so often it is exactly, as you said, a measurement that you look at. And uh, <laughs> different people looking at the same measurement will come to very different conclusions about what, what caused this measurement to be what it is, right? right? And that is, for me, the detective work that I think you can only do if your base is in place, right? Uh, I, mm -hmm. I can give you multiple examples in my career where um, the work that was done, uh, the, the, the experimental work, was interpreted by uh, some of my colleagues that also published then uh, on, on, on their measurements, was interpreted mm -hmm. very different from uh, my interpretation. And that makes science so interesting, right? That you can come to different conclusions. And at the end, uh, Sherlock Holmes was always right. And he found <laughs> out what was really going on. And so hopefully uh, we come to the conclusion at the end of the day and, and hopefully you apply your de deductive capabilities properly. So. That is what, mm -hmm. what I believe is the should be the motivation for students to learn in class uh, and not to think about, hey, um, let me get uh, just a check mark and, and I get a degree and, and, and that's it. Because if you're later on challenged with another problem and the problems mm -hmm. will come if you're working somewhere, it doesn't matter, academia or in, industry, and you don't mm -hmm. have the tools, the tool set to, to be a good detective, right? Mm -hmm. I I think you're not doing yourself a favor because what happens then, and I've seen it, uh, mm -hmm. that well-educated students uh, on a paper uh, will ultimately do less than they could have if they would have challenged themselves to really get the deep insights. And, and so that, 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 that is something that's hard to convey and doesn't make sense. I have two boys, 24 and 20. I, from time to time, try <laughs> to tell them some of these things. Uh, uh, they wouldn't. They wouldn't buy into that. So I'm, I'm, as a father, not surprised that the, these kind of statements don't make always sense or <laughs> fall on on fertile ground. Um, mm -hmm. So, <laughs> but it's, it's it's truly what I believe. Let's put it this way. <laughs> well, it makes it, to go back to the Sherlock Holmes analogy, right? If you read about the, the stories, right, it's always talking about how he's constantly reading new books and reading, learning all kinds of new information so he could be a better detective. That's why there's always the scene of the guy who comes in and he says, oh, my shoe has this red dirt. And he's like, that dirt is from this specific <laughs> part. And yeah, so you, he'd be like, well, you, clearly you came from Germany you know, because <laughs> right, of some on. lint. Yeah, but it's, you know, the breadth of, of information. So that, you know, that's, that's uh, sort of uh, the other way we could go is that uh, I see that um, a lot of your sort of research career has been uh, dedicated to sort of solving the mystery of what's killing Moore's law to keep going right. on the murder in the dark. Uh, so, so to, to look at it from that perspective, I see that you you did your PhD at the Technical University, and I'm going to butcher this because I do not speak Germany. I don't speak German well. So, the te Technical University of Aachen. Yeah, Aachen. Mm -hmm. Aachen. So, uh, and then it says here you did your your PhD in quantum transport in these low dimensional systems. Um, so. What what was your PhD like? Like, if we could go back to 1991 to 1995, uh, and we were to follow you around with a camera, what was your daily life sort of like? So, so let me let me go um, one year before then, just to put things in the perspective. So, mm -hmm. um, I had just um, so I started studying physics in in Aachen, mm -hmm. and we were 400 people, 400 undergraduates uh, starting. Mm -hmm. And you probably know that um, education in Germany is for free, so no tuition. And uh, that um, also means that the, uh, the uh, professors there uh, feel they can apply whatever standard they want because right there is no financial burden for the students. So of those uh, 400 uh, undergraduate students, um, mm -hmm. 80, 80 graduated at the end of uh, the time of and at my or undergraduate time. Wow. And and that is brutal. Uh, that's brutal, right. And so going through this, and that's why I mentioned this, going through this really um took quite a bit out of me. Uh it was it was a very tough time. And mm -hmm. at close to the end of all of this, I, I contacted my mom, so almost four years into the process. And yes. I said to her, you know, this is not what I signed up for. Um I'm going to quit. 
Yeah. I'm going to become a medical doctor. So be prepared. I'm going to start all over and go to medical <laughs> school. So I guess that puts it in perspective how hard it is. It's because in in the United States, medical school is considered one of the toughest tracks. <laughs> <laughs> it <got> easier. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe I would have said the same then at the end of the day. What came to my rescue, and, uh -huh. and that's why that, what came to my rescue is a friend of mine telling me, you know what? There is this research institutions where uh, institution where, where we are really doing experimental work because I had told him that what I was frustrated about is all this theoretical stuff that I've learned that I couldn't apply, right? There was mm -hmm. no real internship that I could apply this. And so I joined him in the research center in Jülich and i suddenly said this makes sense now i get it okay, oh, and so okay. You, you would have seen following me back then um uh in in the time from 1991 you would have seen me happily jumping through the labs and feeling suddenly everything is good and 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 dealing with these little samples and doing my stuff that i always liked in electronics and device physics so this would have been your observation uh, Happy trooper mm -hmm. that uh, that that finally made sense out of life somehow, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it also <laughs> it also resulted in me being rather ignorant about um, what would I do next with what I just like doing, right? Because yeah. I was I was playing at, at this at this border between um, well, I was a physicist, but I did mm -hmm. what most of my physics colleagues called dirt physics, right? Condensed matter physics, dirt physics. So not mm -hmm. really high end physics. So they would look down at the stuff I was doing. Yeah. And I was working on devices. And so my engineering colleagues would look at me and say, hey, you have no idea what, what it really means to do engineering stuff. And, and so I was, I was really the outsider, <laughs> not, oh. not appreciated by anyone for the kind of stuff I was doing. That, that that gets to my heart because I did physics in my undergrad and I also <laughs> have a strong interest in applied stuff. You know, you live in this wonderful world where you're too theoretical for the engineers and you're too right. applied for the physicists. So you, Correct. Correct. everyone's Correct. like, well, what are you doing? Correct. And so <laughs> I see. So, but so what has uh, changed since then, I think, Sam, is that um, the, it actually resulted in me having suddenly Suddenly, mm -hmm. uh, in, in around 19, let's say almost 2000, suddenly I had opportunities like nobody else because suddenly nano electronics, nanotechnology took off. Right. And, and none of my colleagues knew how to deal with that. I mean, it's overstated. Okay. Few people knew how to deal with this because right. exactly the background that I had collected, I mean, the, the knowledge I have collected in this, in this field, uh, mm -hmm. since, um, since I started my master's and then PhD and then continued working on this as an assistant professor in, in Germany, a physics department, that yeah. knowledge base was so unique that it suddenly put me in a position that I uh, had multiple opportunities to go to different places. I so I'm saying that because I think many of you, maybe it's useful, maybe not. It's almost impossible in my book to predict really how things will proceed, progress. It, right over the course of years when you're studying hard the only thing you can do is to do what you are good at and what you are good at is typically what you enjoy so okay. this, this is what i believe in right this is if you don't like what you're doing stop immediately and do something else because you will never be good at it right but if you yeah. truly believe in that this is something you enjoy don't panic <laughs> if you look at the market and feel oops what am i i mean Normally, good things happen if you are prepared, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think that so somebody said that, uh, what is it? Luck is opportunity meets preparedness. I that's think somebody said that that's the definition. Nobel Prize winner, I think, said that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. You know you know my, my talking points better than I do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay, so, so now, so basically you're saying that it was the kind of unique opportunity. But there are two questions I want to ask because I think that a lot of students, you know, we see our as these sort of uh, demigods that came, you know, fully formed as researchers since a young age. So I have two questions which are closely related. What is the most humorous mistake you ever made in your PhD research? And uh, that's the first question. And the second one is, which one is it that after you finished whatever it is you're doing, you realize that it was the most idiotic mistake you made? You know, for example, uh, I think uh, whenever I was repairing my car, I spent a whole day removing a wheel and then I found out that I removed the uh, the wheel on the opposite side <laughs> so this is this kind of mistake yeah so, so 
I, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm going to twist this question slightly differently. I tell you what mattered, what experience and what mistake that I made mattered the most mm -hmm. in my own development. So let me twist this around. And of maybe course. it's humorous from the, from the, in the sense that if you would have looked at my uh, old self, maybe you would have smirked about it. So um, I, I was, and it comes down to communication and, and being self-critical. And so back then as a young guy now being full of energy feeling uh i i can do whatever i want and i'm invincible and all these good things um i had an older technician that i dealt with and um mm -hmm. i felt i was the most pleasant person that there is on earth and uh, i found out that this technician was complaining about me being incredibly arrogant behind my back to my colleagues Mm. And, and um, I, I could not understand. I mean, I was so full of myself and I thought, well, that's impossible. I, I'm, I'm so nice. But I, I did challenge myself. I think that was the best thing I did. I went to him and said, look, I am so sorry. I, I heard about this. This is, this is not how I perceived myself, but you have to help me because if you think about me in this way, and that matters, right? It doesn't matter how I think about myself, how mm -hmm. other things about you. Please help me understand which how I come across as arrogant. And this older guy was a nice enough to to help, but but B also cared enough about me that that he gave me advice and and tutored me in some sense as a technician in in an, in an area that um, I am so grateful for having made this mistake. It's not numerous, numerous maybe, but made this mistake and learned from my mistake because I overcame my own arrogance to to talk to this guy. I can only tell every single of you one thing, right? Communication is the key and communication means to listen, to listen mm -hmm. to others. Communication does not mean to give speeches. And, and many people can give wonderful speeches, but look around how many people can be self-critical and listen to criticism and taking it in and trying to change something. Because the only thing that you can change is yourself. I'm not able to change my kids once I have made up my mind. I cannot change a student. I cannot change a colleague. I can only change myself. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's that's uh, excellent. Uh, excellent advice. Because I guess you, I, I, I know that some people when they run into difficulty with experiments, right? This is something I learned sort of on my skin was that if you if you become involved in your experiment and you begin to you your the way you view the experiment and the way you emotionally handle it is actually like you were saying changing yourself you need to you have to learn to modulate yourself the experiment is reality how you react to it how you interpret it is your control and that's what you have to exercise to to basically focus on on yourself to improve right. yourself, to improve your process, and also to, yeah. So you were just going to say, yeah. So so yeah. What you brought up is is one of those um, very difficult lessons. I think all of us learn once we start to do something that is closer to professional life, which is PhD work, for example. That you suddenly uh, realize things are a not under your control, uh, uh, but b you have to keep going. You have to kind of find a way to overcome this problem. And I've seen that very, very capable students that have been blessed by, by being incredibly smart and, and, and being able in a book smart way to, to ace every single exam, right? That they suddenly crumbled when things didn't work out in the lab. And mm -hmm. that is an, an entirely different uh, uh, type of work to deal with your failure there, to overcome this, to pull yourself together, to get up in the morning, right, and, and do it again. And that is a, um, a character feat that some very smart students sometimes do not have. And, and on the other hand side, uh, some people do have that, that had struggled in class to some extent, mm -hmm. right? And so this is, this is something specific and special, I think, for all of you guys. Uh, dealing with this, but if you go through with this, if you if you find your answer, if you find your solution without shortcuts, right, mm -hmm. you are so much better prepared for life. Because reality is, we will always somewhere, right, in our future face problems that we will not solve in the first place. Right. Yeah. 
yeah, that's that's how I how I definitely learned this research. Uh, so I unfortunately think we're coming very close to time. Uh, are there if you could force every student in Burke to memorize like one lesson that you have to give from everything you've experienced in your life, like what what lesson would you like force us all to write on our you know walls so we see them every day? Be diligent. Be incredibly diligent and and well organized and timely in the things you're doing. Do never fall into the trap of procrastinating. Biggest trap out there. Mm -hmm. Right? That is what I would say to every single of you if you can. And I know there are reasons and there are excuses for this, but if you can do this, because with diligence, you can overcome many problems that sheer intelligence, raw intelligence, cannot tackle. Mm. So don't make the mistake again to assume I'm smart, this is it. No. If you're not diligent at the same time, your smarts only get you so far. I see. Okay. So, you know, I do have a question. You mentioned that to be very, very diligent. Um, what tactics do you use to kind of combat any kind of excuses or if you are inclined to procrastinate? Because I know every one of us, right, has the inclination, right? Why get up today to go and <laughs> turn the gears a little bit farther, right? Yeah. So, so you, you would laugh about if you look around my office space here, not mm -hmm. only do I put all my um, meetings and little reminders and everything that I need to think about and I know I could forget, not only do I put that into my calendar and I have little things everywhere, I have also right now around four or five different pieces of papers where little notes saying, remember this, 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 do this, this and this. And so no matter what I do, even if I not, don't look at my computer, I see these reminders all the time. They jump out, mm -hmm. right? There's no way I can forget about these things. And, mm -hmm. and that became a habit. This is my strategy. This is this is how I'm working these things. And, mm -hmm. and you will actually find yourself growing, being able to handle so much more the more the, the further you go. And, mm -hmm. and that's the, the other thing. Don't keep challenging yourself. Don't think this is it, right? I only need to go through my PhD and then that's done. Sorry to break it to you, but if you really are thriving for excellence and, and want to have a career, you never stop pushing mm. yourself forward. I see. Okay, so constant improvement and being very vicious with procrastination inclination. So be tough, be tough on yourself. Don't expect others to do your work. I guess that's another thing. Mm -hmm. If if I turn around and saying, if I'm just becoming a manager, my life is going to be easy because then I tell the others what to do. If I'm an advisor and I tell you as a student, look, you do all this type of work and I'm not leading by example, right? And I'm not taking the biggest load and I'm not there all the time working. How can I expect others to do something? Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, it looks like we are out of time. Well, thank you so much, Professor Appenzeller. Thank you. Sorry, sorry for the trouble with the, with the Microsoft team. I don't know what I did wrong, but I will learn these things too. Um, oh, so no problem. At all. It has been a pleasure. So thank you for oh. this platform. Appreciate it. Oh, likewise, likewise. Okay. Bye. Have a very good day, Professor. Bye bye. Bye.